welcome back today we are going to look at probability we have already looked at thermodynamics we have looked at thermodynamics and now we want to bridge the gap with the statistical mechanics so now probability is nothing but common sense we encountered this in plenty of occasions in our daily life for example if you cost uh, sorry if you toss a coin then you know that the outcomes are random right so there is a certain probability of getting a head or getting a tail similarly if you roll a die let's say it's a six phase die then the number that comes up is also random so the possible outcomes are one two three four five and six so all of this tells you that nothing in nature is deterministic so this is completely opposite of what you have encountered in newtonian mechanics where given a particle given a single particle given the forces you know that the trajectory is completely deterministic and therefore you can determine the trajectory at later times exactly but here in these events that you see that the outcomes are random right so therefore one has to figure out a way of quantifying probability right so let's say for example if i have a box which has different balls colored balls in it right some of them can be red so let's say two of them are red one of them is blue one of them is green and one of them is black so there are five balls in the box and you pick up one ball at a time then the probability that you pick up you get a red ball is 2 by 5 probability probability of getting a red ball is 2 out of 5 similarly probability of getting a green ball is 1 of 5 and probability of getting a blue ball is also 1 of 5 and probability of getting a black ball is again 1 of 5 right this you are familiar with you have already encountered this you will many times right so now we want to quantify this probability so what is called rules of probability let's drop it down <clears throat> so you see that for an event for a given event which could be like tossing a coin rolling a die there are outcomes we will call these outcomes as omega i right so these are the elements that we normally talk about so these outcomes <coughs> make up what is called the sample space of the system so these outcomes omega i make up the sample space s so that we can write down omega i is equal to s this event where you have tossed a coin is typically what is called a trial so for tossing a coin i know the outcomes are either head or tail and therefore this is the sample space for this event for rolling a die let's be a little bit more specific which is a sixth faced die then the sample space are one two three four five and six 
and this is the sample space. So all the outcomes taken together, they form the sample space. The only request, so this choice of this sample space clearly depends on the event, on the type of event that you're looking at and the type of probabilistic question you are asking, right? But as a general rule, As a general rule, the outcomes omega i and omega j are mutually exclusive. What does this mean? This essentially means that they do not occur simultaneously. Right? This is my first. The second one that we want to also look at that the total number of outcomes must give you the sample space. If you are missing something, then you know that this is not the sample space, which essentially means that <coughs> the elements, the set of elements should be complete, which we wrote down in the earlier statement that omega i must give you the sample space. So given these two, one can write down that the probability, you can assign this pro a probability to these outcomes by saying that p of i must be greater than equal to 0 less than equal to 1. This is nothing but common sense and this is what is called the positivity rule. The second quantity, the second rule that one should also define is sum of p of i must be 1. So probability of all the outcomes must be unity and this is what is called normalization. Additivity if A and B are mutually exclusive, which means that A intersection B is equal to phi, then probability of A union B is P of A plus p of b. One can generalize this statement also by saying that if a i and a j two of these outcomes are pairwise mutually exclusive then p of this is sum over p of a i. For example So, if AI and AJ are pairwise mutually exclusive, which means that if AI intersection AJ is the null set phi, then <coughs> the additivity theorem can be generalized in this form. For example, if I roll a die and then I ask the question that what is the probability of getting a face or a number let's say 3 or 6 then the probability of this is essentially p of 1 6 sorry of getting a value 6 which we shall denote p6 and a probability of getting a value p3 which is 1 by 6 plus 1 by 6. So we will write down this as p of 3 or 6 is equal to 1 by 6 which is 1 third. Right? So now what we come to is essentially the interpretation 
of probability. So whatever we have discussed is essentially we have quantified the rules of probability. So now we want to look at interpretation of probability and there are mainly two interpretations that is mostly encountered. <coughs> One of them is based on symmetry and the example for this is a coin toss in which the possible outcomes are head and tail and therefore here it's a two-state system in the sense it is a Z2 symmetry and each of these has a probability half and half. A similar argument is let's say an n-faced die. In an n-faced die there are n faces and if it's a fair die then all of these faces are equally likely to appear so the outcomes are i equal to 1, 2 all the way up to n and this is also your sample space and therefore probability pi of getting a face with number i is equal to 1 by n. So this is clearly based on symmetry. The other interpretation which is also often used is the frequency interpretation. Now in the frequency interpretation what you have is essentially you have n number of trials. So if you are tossing a coin, you toss it n number of times. Then probability of getting a head is the number of times you get a head divided by the total number of trials that you have done. Similarly, probability of getting a tail is the number of tails <coughs> divided by the total number of trials. So this is typically what is called a frequency interpretation and this is what is called a symmetry interpretation. Most often in experimental science as well as in analysis, in data analysis, this is the interpretation that you see. The frequency interpretation is the interpretation that is most often. So for any in the, fre in the frequency interpretation, for any e outcome A, the number of times that outcome appears divided by the total number of trials is the probability of this. So now we want to look at what is called the conditional probability. And the conditional probability as the name suggests is that you are asking a different question now, conditional. So the question that you are asking now that what is the probability of an event A given that another event B has occurred. And that we denote as PAB is essentially given by PA intersection B divided by PB. Right? If you want to ask a different question that is what is the other way around probability of B given that A has occurred and the answer to that would be PB intersection A divided by P of A. Now both these very simple expressions have a very nice interpretation. What you are doing since it's being conditioned on an event A, you are essentially restricting the whole sample space to the event of B and this becomes your new sample space. To illustrate this, let's look at an Euler diagram and let's say this is my sample space S. Let's denote the events by different colored circles. There is a green and then there is a red. It's not drawn to scale, right? So let's now put uh, label the events. Let's say this is A. The blue one is B1. The red one is B2 and the green one is B3, right? And now we need to put numbers to it. So let's, this is Point 3 it does, does not this point 3 does not include the area which is enclosed by the blue circle but rather just the part over here this is the difference with the Venn diagram this is point 2 this is point 2 right and then 
B1 let's call this as point 1 and B3 also we will call it as point 1. The first thing to note is that I have what is the total number that it should add up to unity. So point 0.3 plus point 0.1 is point 0.4, point 0.6, point 0.8, point 0.9 and therefore the rest of the sample space has point 0.1. Now then you should note that probability of A is point 0.3 plus point 0.1 plus point 0.2 which is point 0.6. Probability of B2 is point 0.4. Probability of B3 is 0.1. Now let's say you want to ask the question probability of A given that B2 has occurred. right? If you look at this very carefully then you see that half the time B2 has happened A has happened. So very quickly you can see that this answer is half. And if I want to use the formula that I've given over here, then A intersection B is 0.2 and the probability of B2 is 0.4, which is half, which everything agrees very nicely. <coughs> A given that B1 has happened, probability of A given that B1 has happened is essentially, if you look at this Euler diagram, then you see every time B1 has happened, a1 has happened, unlike the first case when you looked at B2. Not always when B2 has happened, A has happened. Only half the times B2 has happened, A has happened. And therefore, you see, this is prob the fir first probability is half, but the second probability is 1, and the answer is also, if you, you get back the same answer, if you use the expression that is given over there. Probability of A given B3 is zero which is very true because probability of a intersection b3 is zero so this essentially tells you that uh, the two expressions you have it clearly tells you this illustration clearly tells you that you are restricting the sample space to the sample space of b well, in this case B2, in this case B1, and in this case B2. So that these events B1, B2, B3, they become your new sample space. When you are asking for the conditional probability, P A given B1, P A given B2, P A given B3. Now let's take a formal derivation, try to see if we can formally get these ideas. So let S be a sample space, right? And if this sample space has outcomes omega, right? So that this forms the sample space. Suppose that now an event has occurred and this event B is a subset of S, correct? Now a new probability needs to be assigned on omega with this knowledge so we want to assign a new probability on omega we want to assign a new probability of omega given that we know that the event b which belongs to a subset s or a subset of s has happened so if omega belongs to b then probability of omega given that b has happened is equal to let's say alpha times omega where p omega was the unconditional probability we did not condition it on anything and clearly if omega does not belong to b then p of omega given b has happened is equal to zero right we further have the normalization condition that if this belongs to s probability that this is equal to one correct so I can now expand this. So I can write down P omega belonging to S as this one as P omega belonging to B, P omega B plus P omega belonging to B complement or P omega not belonging to B since we have used that.
but by our conjecture with the hypothesis that we started off with this is zero and therefore I have omega belonging to B and this quantity is alpha times P of omega since omega is now restricted to B therefore this is P of B and the left hand side is 1 so that alpha becomes very nicely P of B and therefore you see for any event omega that belongs to B you have reassigned the probabilities that P of omega given that B has happened is 1 of P of B times P of omega right now for any general event A let's say for any general event A I want to write down P of A given B and that by definition is that omega belongs to A intersection B so P of omega given that this event belongs to this set of A intersection B plus omega belonging to A intersection B complement which is the rest of the sample space but this is 0 right so therefore I have sum of our omega belonging to A intersection B P of omega given B which is equal to sum of omega A intersect belonging omega be sum of all the outcomes belonging to the set A intersection B P of omega divided by P of B and therefore this is 1 over P of B P of A intersection B so this is a very simplistic definition the derivation of the expression that we did before so what we essentially again to summarize what we essentially did was we looked at the sample space and then we said look now an event has happened and I want to condition on this event so for that purpose I want to reassign the probabilities of the outcomes given that this event has happened and let's say that event is B so all we did was we looked at we said that if omega belongs to B then this must be a renormalized probability with alpha times P omega if omega does not belong to P then that probability is zero so then we use the normalization condition if omega belongs to S P omega given B must be equal to 1 and once you have the normalization condition then you can expand this as either omega the outcome belongs to B or the outcome does not belong to B if the outcome doesn't belong to B then the probability associated with has been is 0 right <coughs> So therefore, the left hand side is 1 and that gives you the normalization and then if you consider any event A for any general event A, P A given B has happened is essentially P of omega, the probability of an outcome omega, probability of an outcome omega given that B has happened such that omega belongs to A intersection B and a intersection B complement but this probability is 0 then this expression I can find the write down I can substitute for P omega given B and essentially you get this nice result as an example so of conditional probability let's take the following so you know that uh, your neighbor let's say your neighbor has a son right they have two kids so let's say has two children right now given just this information if I ask you that what is the probability that your neighbor the children of your neighbor are both sons he has two sons then you will say oh that is very simple to answer Let's look at the options that we have. Both of them are boys, one of them boy-girl, girl-boy 
and then girl girl so this is the sample space that you are looking at and you will immediately say that look if I do not have any other information then the probability that both of them are boys is one fourth probability that both of them are boys is one fourth equally likely to happen but now I give you an additional information that one of them is a boy so now you ask the second problem ask the question that what is the probability that the other one is also a boy so you ask the question what is the probability that the other child is also a boy right so what you are looking for is essentially you are looking for probability of BB right <clears throat> so in this whole when you say that one of them is a boy then you see this sample space gets restricted to BB BG sorry there is no comma here and to GB right so let's call this as both of them are boys as F and this one as E then the answer that I'm looking for P of F given E because this part E is essentially is the answer to this question that if one of them is a boy then your new sample space is just these three right and which is E and the answer that you're looking for is what is the probability that the other child is also a boy is essentially that the, your neighbor has two boys is F let's denote them as F then the answer is P of F intersection E given P of E right so that is probability of BB divided by probability of BB BG and GB correct the probability of BB is clearly one fourth which we have worked out and the other one is three fourth and therefore this is one third right so this is how you essentially use condition uh, evaluate conditional probabilities it becomes very very clear to you once you write down the questions and the, once you write down the sample space uh, that you are really interested in that the conditioning has forced you to do so one can of course write down a frequency interpretation interpretation of conditional probability And there, suppose you have n trials, right? And then essentially you count the number of times that event A has occurred, and let's denote it as NA is number of times event A has occurred and nb is the number of times event b has occurred and one can also have the number of times when both a and b has occurred right <clears throat> then if n is large enough statistically speaking so then p of n a as we have p of a as we had worked out earlier the frequency interpretation p of b is n b over n and p of a intersection b is n of a intersection b by n 
where this denotes essentially the number of times A and B has jointly occurred. So, the conditional probability in the frequency interpretation becomes N A intersection B divided by N B. Right? So, we want to now look at what is called the partition theorem. So, although, so please realize that this material on probability is just a bridging between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. So, we are not going to do anything in detail because I am sure you have learned probability by now in several times. So, now let us look at the partition theorem. What does the partition theorem tell you? That is so let the sample space be written as, right? Then essentially AI is called a partition of S. What does this mean? That means I can have this. This is my whole of my sample space. I can A, right? So this can be A1, this can be A2, this can be uh, A3. A4, A5 and this can be A6. So, these all these A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 are events and these are subsets of S except that this whole thing essentially makes up the sample space S, right. If I now consider a B which is a subset of S and denote it over here like this way, right, and then you see there are several intersections. Right? And now with this, so let us call this subset as B, I can write down B as union of uh, right. So, then if I want to calculate the probability of B, then essentially I will calculate indirectly the probability of this quantity, right. And by the additivity theorem, this is nothing but sum over i probability of B A intersection A i, right. But then I know that. Uh, Essentially, this is going to be sum over i p of a i p of b given a i, right. So, this tells me that the probability of b I can write down as in this particular form where a i is at the partition of S. Now, I also know that probability of A is probability of A given B plus probability of A minus of B, that is B has not occurred. P of A intersection B is, sorry, P of conditional probability of A given that P has occurred is P of A intersection B divided by P of B. And as we had already written down, P of B A, given that A has happened, is P of A intersection B is divided by P of A, which means it clearly that A intersection B is, you can either write it down P of B, which is also P of B, given that A has happened, times the probability of A, right? Therefore, you see, I can write down this P of this conditional probability that probability of an event A given B has happened as probability of an event B given that A has happened times P A divided by P B, right. Now, 
if there are multiple events this is just one event i'm talking about if let's say this a there are multiple events ai and i want to know p of ai given b then p of ai given b is this just very simple expression p of b given ai times p of ai divided by p of b but p of b we just calculated right using the partition theorem we calculated this as sum over we use this expression p of ai times p of b ai so this is the generalization of the Bayes theorem this relation that you see over here is the Bayes theorem now the advantage of this expression the Bayes theorem that we have seen is first of all not only it tells us how the probability is modified with the presence of a new evidence but you see in this expression what we have done is we have written down p a given b has occurred in terms of p b given a times p a divided by p b so we have kind of recast this calculation of this probability often the three quantities that you see on the right hand side of this expression is much easier to evaluate and is much easier to estimate also so therefore this gives us a very useful expression <coughs> As an example, let's say I have a computer program, right? And this computer program has two modes. So, uh, uh, well, let's say computer chess program, and this has two modes. One is an expert mode, and the other one is a novice mode, right? Now the expert mode, so we will say that this is the expert mode, this is the novice mode. The, in the expert mode, the Q, the expert mode beats you 75% of time, right? And the novice mode will The novice mode, you have a 50% chance of winning. So the, what you do now is, let's say you close your eyes and you select a mode. You do not know which mode you have chosen, right? You randomly choose one of the modes and the computer wins both times. So you select a mode randomly and the computer wins both times right now you ask the question that what is the probability that you chose the novice mode so i want to ask the question that what is the probability that you chose the novice mode See, if all this information was not given, which means all this information means that you, the computer wins both times. If this information was not given to you, then you would say that the probability of choosing a novice mode and winning twice is one fourth, right? <coughs> Sorry, uh, is 50%. So probability of choosing the novice mode and winning is 50%, right? So, but now, <coughs> Essentially, what is given asked, what is being asked here is what is the probability that you chose the novice mode given that you have the computer has won twice. So, what is the probability that you seek novice mode given WW? Right? So W denotes a win. But this I can clearly write down WW N. I'm reversing the question now times P of N divided by P of w w right by the base theorem that we have written down i am just reversing this expression so i want to know what is the probability that i have chosen the novice mode given that the computer has won twice and i want to rewrite this i want to evaluate this 
by choosing this expression where it is expressed in terms of a different I think probability that you have of winning twice given that you have chosen the novice mode right so now probability of choosing a novice mode is half because there are only either you choose the novice mode or you choose the expert mode and you have closed your eyes and you have selected one option right <coughs> and therefore probability of winning given that you have chosen the novice mode is one fourth that is very clear right now I have to figure out what is the probability of winning twice and here essentially there are two possibilities one is you chose novice mode and won twice you chose expert mode and won twice correct so therefore I can write down PWW as probability that you have chosen the novice mode and won twice plus the probability that you have chosen the expert mode and won twice right <coughs> so probability of choosing the novice mode and winning twice is probability of n times ww n okay so let us write down the in, in the same thing in a different way so that it is much easier to so probability of winning given novice mode times probability of novice mode plus probability of winning given expert mode times probability of expert mode this we have already calculated to be one fourth now this is creating a slight problem and this is half correct and this I know is 3 fourth whole square into half and if I add everything let's say this is uh, this is going to be 1 by 8 plus 9 by 32 which is 13 by 32 so now I have all the information so now I can calculate P of n w w as p w w n p n divided by p of w w which is p w w n is one fourth half and this is 13 by 32 so this is going to be 4 over 13 which is approximately 0.31 so now you see the answer is that there's a 30 percent choice <coughs> of you choosing the novice mode if it has reduced from 50 percent to 30 percent so the probability of choosing the novice mode was 50 percent right good so now that we have the bare bone structures of probability theory uh, ready we want to look at some examples of probability distributions so we will first consider discrete distributions since whatever we have been doing so far have discrete outcomes so the classic distribution that we will encounter in physics is what is called a binomial distribution 